Really quickly, I just want to share a word with you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And a lot of what I'm going to say today kind of goes towards Pastor Appreciation Day and what this means and so forth. So we'll, we'll jump right into it, but let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful uh, for the opportunity to worship you today. We are, we are thankful that we can come and, and celebrate you and celebrate church and celebrate the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God and, and how good you've been to this church over 36 years and, and how good you're going to continue to be uh, no matter who's behind this pulpit. We are grateful in the name of Jesus that, that you will be lifted up, you will be exalted, that lives will continue to be changed because the gospel will be preached from this place. Now, Lord, as we dive into your word today, we ask that you encourage us, plant your seed and your word on the inside of our hearts that it might bring forth fruit to the glory of God. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, says, Would to God uh, you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. The message I want to preach this morning is entitled, Simply Jesus. Um, as we celebrate Pastor Appreciation Day today, it's cool uh, always to be a pastor, but it's even cooler to be a pastor on a day like this, right? Um, it's kind of like your birthday. Everybody makes a big deal out of it. Eventually you get so old, nobody cares. Um, but it's an honor to serve, honestly, in such an awesome church. So today is not just a day to celebrate pastors. It's a day to celebrate the beauty of church, uh, a place where sacrificial love and service can be clean, clearly seen, starting with servant leaders. Uh, you have to know that anybody who stands up behind this pulpit and preaches the gospel understands that we are serving you. Um, we like to honor those who preach and teach, and many times we like to put pastors or evangelists or ministers up on a pedestal, but we all understand we're on the same road together. We're all headed to the same heaven. We're all serving the same Jesus we all go through the same struggles, the same battles, the same ups and downs. We've all, we've all faced the same heartaches and pains together. And so we recognize as pastors, as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are all servants. David was a king, but when he was in the presence of God, he was a worshiper just like everybody else. And so we live, the Bible tells us, in an upside-down kingdom. If you want to live, you've got to die. If you want to gain something, you've got to give it away. If you want to lead, then you've got to serve. And so the church is where we find family, it's where we find healing, it's where we find hope, it's where we find strength to face each day, and it's where we can find our purpose. Today I believe that the church is a beautiful place. I've, I've been in church for as long as I can remember. My dad was saved when I was about a year and a half old. My mother was saved before I even came along. And so uh, I've been in church my whole life cut my teeth on pews. We sat in sanctuaries with our parents. Uh, we got smacked in the back of the head when you acted up. We listened to the preacher preach. I went to Sunday school. After Sunday school, you went to church. I went to vacation Bible school when they actually had it during the middle of the day. I grew up in church. I grew up in the beauty of church. I grew up in the beauty of singing. I grew up in the beauty of hymns and, and the preaching of the gospel. I grew up scared to death of hell. I grew up knowing that, that there was a goodness that could be found in God. I grew up in a home that loved Jesus. I've been in ministry in some impact, in some way, since I was 15 years old. Preached my first sermon when I was 16. Man, it was a mess. <laughs> I've been a youth pastor, and as, as, as Ryan said, some of my, the, the greatest times of my life took place when I was a youth pastor. Those of you who may not know the story, they, I had Susie, she was a little uh, uh, Suzuki Swift, five-speed Suzuki Swift, and uh, ran, it had like a lawnmower engine in it or something, and uh, but it got like 60 miles of a gallon, and, and uh, I could only get over Lens Creek Mountain in third gear. I couldn't. If I stiffed it to fourth, it just went <laughs> She just couldn't make it. 
But actually, it was Ron Williams and, and Seth. They were fighting. They were fighting over who was going to sit in the front seat of the car, and they were wrestling around. And they ran into my side mirror and snapped it. They pushed it back and snapped it. It didn't come off. It's kind of hung. It's still there. You know, we just, I just kind of, they tried to move it back into place. Uh, and so every so often, while I was driving, it would just fold in. <laughs> so one day, Ron Williams, I had taken him over to Wendy's, and he got some food from Wendy's, and we were driving, and we crossed the railroad tracks over, we're getting ready to cross the railroad tracks, and the mirror flopped in. He started laughing at it. So I rolled my window down, and I grabbed his bag of Wendy's, and I sat it out on the ground in the middle of the railroad tracks, and we took off driving. <laughs> I said, if you want your Wendy's, you might want to get out because there's a car coming. You should have seen him sprinting down the high avenue <laughs> to save his Wendy's back. <laughs> Ministry has not always been fun. It's not always been easy, but it's always been a blessing. And so this is what pastor appreciation is about. It's about a celebration of a messed up place, who have, of messed up people who have found a Savior that has radically and completely transformed our lives. And so as I think about LFC, I have to honor my father. This place is the result of his obedience to the call of God on his life. He needed help, for sure. But because he said yes, God has done some beautiful things. Amen. A small group of folks encouraged him and rallied around him and to build something really, really awesome. We uh, started in houses. We moved into a beat-up building that was attached to a car wash. We started out on only one side of the building, and then we got bigger and got the other side of the building. I kicked an outlet that was stuck out of the floor and shocked myself one day in the middle of a sermon. I wasn't preaching it, thank God, but Dad didn't even stop. I think everyone thought it was the Holy Ghost. It didn't feel like it. Again, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but it's the first place to play the drums, beat the living daylights out of those things. A lot of wonderful memories down at the Car Wash Cathedral. Eventually, we built this sanctuary on the giving of about 50 people, 25 of them were kids. <clears throat> God has done miracles here, God has saved lives here. God has encouraged and planted seeds of the call of ministry in other people's lives here. And my dad has preached some really good sermons here, producing a lot of Bible-believing, Bible-loving followers of Jesus. Amen. Today, I appreciate him. Yes. And today, I appreciate my mother. She went to heaven last Sunday. And we honored her memory this past Wednesday and Thursday in a very beautiful and appropriate way. And today on Pastor's Appreciation Day, I, also, I want to honor her faith. Pastor Don pointed out something that I had been thinking about before she had passed. But he pointed out during his message at her funeral that mom's faith is what prayed dad's rebellious heart into the kingdom. That, Don didn't put it that way, but that was dad. <laughs> He'd been running from God since he was 16 years old. And as the story goes, Mama had been attending a revival and she came home. Talk, they were talking. And they'd been talking. And Dad had been talking about going to this revival. And after she had this conversation, she called Reverend Kearns and told him everything was going to be okay. That's what Jesus does. Dad got saved and from there the seed of LFC was planted. Mom never really preached a sermon. But her faith set in motion a wonderful work of God. And LFC doesn't exist without the faithfulness of my mother. Amen. And there's a certain phrase in this passage of Scripture that reminds me of my mom. It's the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul says, I'm worried that you would stray from the simplicity that is in Christ. But before we look at that phrase, I always want you to see the context of the passage. I don't want to preach a sermon unless you know what Paul is talking about. And in this passage, we see a pastor's heart. In both of Paul's letters to the Corinthians, 
Paul has to wrestle with the issue that the believers have questioned his apostolic authority. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. It's part of one of the reasons why he wrote these letters. They questioned his credentials as an apostle because they thought in a worldly way. They expected someone with authority to have a certain look. They didn't like Paul's apparent weaknesses. They didn't see, they found his appearance somewhat unimpressive. But Paul looked like Jesus. His authority wasn't just being questioned, but the servant leadership modeled by Jesus was being questioned. But Paul declares his godly jealousy for them. Now we know most, for most parts, jealousy is a vice. It's a sin. It's something that we should avoid. But godly jealousy is a righteous concern for the holiness, the purity, and the Christian standards of God's people. Godly jealousy really is love in action. It's a desire to see the best in people's lives. Because God is not jealous of us He's jealous for us. He wants the best for us. He knows that if our hearts go after something else, if there is a rival in our heart for Him, then we will live unfulfilled, unsatisfied, restless, empty lives. So He's jealous for our hearts because He knows that when we belong to Him, we find our greatest purpose and joy. And so godly jealousy is that desire to see the people of God have an undivided heart committed to Jesus Christ. And so we see that this in Paul's life, he wanted the Corinthians to be a people who could be presented to Jesus as pure and holy, unadulterated by the world. Paul wanted them to make it. He wanted them to be who Christ had called them to become. And he was warning them of the false teachers that were not only undermining the message of the gospel, but they were pulling them away from the simplicity that is in Christ. For Paul, it wasn't all the wisdom of the world that determined how holy you were or how deep you were spiritually. It was a pure and sincere devotion to Jesus. Amen. And that, as we look at this passage of Scripture, reminds me of my mother. She was a woman with a sincere and pure devotion to Jesus. For my mom, she didn't get into our debates about doctrine or the intricacies of theological disagreements. Not that she wasn't doctrinally sound or didn't know theology. For her, it was simply Jesus. Mom's testimony was never one of a dramatic life change because she was such, in such a horrible place in life. If you ever listen to my mother's testimony, she didn't get saved because she was scared of hell. She didn't get saved because someone had to give her an apologetic discourse on why evil exists or why bad things happen to good people. She came to Jesus because the goodness of God drew her to repentance. Yes. Jesus was beautiful to her. And that beauty captured her heart. And you can see this simple but powerful faith in the words that she spoke, in the way that she cared about people, in her devotion to my dad and to this ministry. To her, it was simply Jesus. And everything else was secondary. Everything else paled in comparison. Jesus was enough. And He is enough. Amen. Yes. And that's what I want to get across to you today. I'm not meaning to pray to another funeral sermon. This, pat, this scripture, this sermon's actually been in my mind for over a month. Jesus was enough. He is enough. I remember we had a, a children, someone that was leading our children's ministry years ago, and, and they were teaching the kids some kind of some, some deep stuff. And, and uh, actually, the, the children had a lesson on hell or something one Sunday. And my mother was like, Why aren't we teaching them that God created the trees? That was my mom. The simplicity of Jesus. It all comes back to that. And so really quickly, I want to share from this passage of Scripture two things. What is the lie of the devil that is still being told today that tries to draw us from the reality of the sim simplicity of Jesus? Paul was concerned most deeply about this. That the Corinthians were known for their spiritual or their pursuit of worldly wisdom. The Corinthians considered themselves very spiritual people, which actually opened them up to false teachers. 
And he compared the motivation and tactics of these false teachers to the craftiness of the devil himself. And just as it happened in the garden, the motivation is to turn our hearts away from the simplicity that is in Christ. So what is the lie that the devil told in the garden? Number one, it was a distortion of what God said. The enemy took God's command and distorted it to deceive. Now this is not the main point of the context of this sermon. Point two is, but it starts here. We always have to remember if the enemy can pull you away from the Word, he will conquer you. Yeah. He will conquer you. If he can pull you away from a life anchored and founded upon God's Word, then he will conquer. Yes. Because when our hearts stray from the commands of God, it will find comfort in the words of the world. It will find comfort in the arms and the acceptance of those who have rejected this gospel. So make no mistake about it, once you stray away from God's Word, whatever reason why you may have done it, when you stray away from God's Word, you're going to find yourself grasping and grabbing a hold of worldly things to satisfy you, which can only be satisfied by Jesus. Yeah. Spiritual adultery starts with the rejection of God's standards. Idolatry in Scripture is compared to cheating on God. And so spiritual adultery starts with a rejection of God's standards. Once we bring God down to our level, by redefining what His Word says to fit the culture that we live in, then we find ourselves creating idols that only leave us empty and confused. Idols will always promise and come up short. The enemy will always paint beautiful pictures, but on the other side they bite like a poisonous snake. Sin is not something to play with, and once we stray from God's Word, it will kill us. So he took what God had said. You can eat from any tree of this garden, just do not eat from this tree. The devil took what God had said and distorted it, changed it, rearranged it. Has God not said? Yes. And this is what the enemy will always do. Where is God? Where is the one who made his promise? Isn't this what he said? The enemy is always going to distort the situation to deceive. He's a liar. Amen. And he's the father of it. Yes. Yeah. And some of us are caught up in his lies and we don't even recognize it. The first thing that happened in the garden was a distortion of what God said. Secondly, what is it that he said? You can be like God. This lie preys obviously on our pride. It preyed upon the pride of Eve and Adam and showed them or told them or showed them a gateway of getting to a place where they could be like God. And this lie is twofold. When, when the devil tells Eve and, and, and then Adam, when the enemy deceives them and they disobey, he's telling them, because you can be like God, first of all, that means you don't need God. Hmm. The enemy wanted to take Eve's eyes away from the true source of life. The lie is that God is not enough. Hmm. That there is another source of true life, another source of true joy, another source of true fulfillment. The enemy pointed to the tree and declared that the source of was not really God, but what the tree had to offer. It was worldly knowledge. It was worldly wisdom. If you eat from this tree, he said, you will have the knowledge of good and evil, and you will be like God. You don't need God. You need this tree. Wow. Wow. Yeah. If this is the lie of the enemy. That when our hearts stray from the Creator, we will always find something within creation to replace Him. When our hearts stray from God, we will always find something in creation to replace Him. Whatever it is that brings us the most joy, fulfillment, whatever it is that defines who we are or establishes our purpose is our de facto God. And so the enemy wanted to point Eve away from God and God's purpose. He wanted to point Adam away from the fact that God was enough. That God's words were the ones that he needed to trust. That God knew what was best for them. 
in spite of what they thought they were going to get. And isn't this how it always happens? Isn't this always how it happens? I thought I wanted it, and then when I got it, I don't want it. Yeah. You ever order something off the menu, sounded good, looked good in the picture, then you got it, you bit into it, and you're like, I don't want it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, it doesn't happen very often to me. <laughs> Probably you shoot if you put enough stuff on it. I'm a fan of food. But that is, that's how the picture is painted. This is what you need. This is what you want. And then when you get it, I don't want it. I've seen boyfriends and girlfriends do that. This guy don't want that girl. That girl don't want that guy. But as soon as that girl starts getting her interest in another guy, that guy also wants that girl. We recognize that the enemy paints pictures, that the world paints pictures such as this. It's not God that you need. It's this relationship that you need. It's this job that you need. It's this much money that you need. It's the alcohol that you need. It's the acceptance of your friend that you need. It's your popularity. That's what you need. This is what you need. Not God. You need the tree. You need the tree. But the problem is, is you eat from the tree, you die. You die. And the second part of this lie is not only that you don't need God, but by extension, what God is withholding from you is what will truly satisfy. This has always been the lie that the world pulls on the appetites of our flesh. The world and the flesh tell us that what we are missing by following Jesus is what we really need. That a life giving in to our basest desires is what will satisfy us. That giving in to the desires and the wants of the flesh, to giving in to the worldly temptations that are meant to draw us into a place of sin, that these are the things that will truly bring us the most hope. Hell and destruction are never satisfied. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. And this is why we are consistently restless. While what we have is not enough. It's the pull of the world, the pull of our appetites. It's the lie of the enemy that tells you there's something else. God is not what you need. There's something else. And so he lies to us and says that what you have is not enough. Your marriage is not enough. Your job is not enough. Your church or your spiritual life is not enough. I need to experience more. I need to be satisfied. And it's the lie that Paul was fighting against. He wanted them to know and experience that Jesus is enough. Yeah. He wanted the Corinthians to recognize, I know that you're spiritual people and you consider yourself spiritual. You consider yourself intact with the spiritual world. That you have contact with, with the Holy Spirit. And if you read through First and Second Corinthians, Paul is consistently correcting them. That it wasn't, the problem with the Corinthians wasn't that they weren't spiritual. They believed in the gifts of the Spirit. There were people speaking in tongues. There were women standing up in services prophesying. There were people that were coming in laying hands on the sick. And people were getting healed. They were seeing the miraculous power of God. But these same people were open to lies. They had judged their spiritual life by what they were producing. And Jesus said, it's not what you're producing. It's simply Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. So as a pastor, I pray that every sermon you hear challenges you. Yes. I pray that no matter who stands behind this pulpit, because I promise you, the gospel will be preached from this pulpit. Whether I'm here tomorrow or whether it's Pastor Don or whomever, the gospel will be preached from this pulpit. And I pray that something is planted in your heart that will bring you knowledge that will deepen your understanding of the Word of God. But at the end of the day, if I don't point you to the simplicity of Jesus, that eternal life is defined by knowing God and Jesus Christ whom He has sent. That as Paul said, we should know nothing among us save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Amen. If I don't point you to the simplicity of Jesus, then in some way I have failed. 
We can be doctrinally deep and theologically wise, but not know the one whom that knowledge points to. We can debate over certain points of Scripture and allow them to divide us or even push us away from God. But we can remember that Christianity is really just simply Jesus. I remember running into a teenager. We took a group of teenagers out one time and was just walking the streets and thought we'd find people and talk to them. And I walked up on a teenage girl and we started talking about church and Jesus and talking about the gospel. And she told us, she's like, I just have too many problems with stories in the Old Testament. It's hard for me to believe that Noah's Ark existed or that Moses split the Red Sea. I didn't beat her over the head with the Bible and tell her you're going to hell because you don't believe in Moses. I did tell some people they were going to hell, but not a lot of them. <laughs> I didn't beat her over the head. I didn't shame her into the questions that she asked. I just looked at her and said, I understand. I completely understand. Well, my question is not what you're going to do with Noah. It's not what you're going to do with Moses. It's not what you're going to do with the story of Joseph. What are you going to do with Jesus? Because yeah. if Jesus died and rose again, then what he has to say matters. We can deal with the Noah stuff later. We can deal with the Red Sea stuff later. Jesus just said, follow me. Follow me. There may be stuff in the scriptures that you wrestle over, that you question, that you don't understand. Go to Jesus. We can talk about those things. We can wrestle over that stuff. It's Jesus. Amen. He saves lives. He transforms hearts. And so I ask you this morning, do you know Him? Are you pursuing Him? One of the legacies that my mother will leave behind is that she just loved Jesus. She just loved Jesus. You want to argue over Calvinism or Arminianism, she'd just go in the other room. <laughs> you want to argue about the many different views of the end of time, she'll be in there making a sandwich. <laughs> Do you want to talk about Jesus? She'll pull up a chair. Simply Jesus. And so I'm asking you today, are you pursuing Him? Do you know Him? Is Jesus enough? Because as a pastor, that's what I want you to remember on Pastor Appreciation Day. Jesus is enough. Yeah. He's enough. He's enough for your broken heart. He's enough for your broken body. He's enough for your messed up life. He's enough for your ups and downs, your joys, your, your, your downs, your successes, your failures. He's enough for your marriage. He's enough for your children. Jesus is enough. So let's start there. Let's start there. Let's start with Jesus. That's what we appreciate today. Bow your heads with me here. Father, in the name of Jesus, what an honor it is to consistently honor you. What an honor it is to be called Christians. We pray, oh God, that you would help us not take that lightly. That we not take lightly the call to follow Jesus. That we would not take lightly the call to go back to the simplicity that is Christ. Defines who we are as the people of God. It saves us in our darkness. It heals us in our sickness. It gives us hope in our hopeless situations. Thank you. Thank you for the seeds of faith that have been planted in this church. Thank you for faithful men and women who put their hand to the plow. And now here we are. Thank you, God, that you are faithful. That no matter who leads or who stands behind this pulpit, we are all servants of Jesus. We're all just striving to follow you. And we want Living Faith Church to be a church that follows you. We are grateful for every pastor, every leader, every volunteer. Lord, we don't put all of our trust in just a man or just a woman. We put all of our trust in Jesus. We know that you'll never fail us. So we turn our hearts to you today.